Hi everyone, this week we are going to go over the case of externalities and public goods. As mentioned in the first lecture, externalities and public goods are special cases where the market equilibrium is going to fail at being Pareto efficient. Today, we are going to see why externalities and public goods lead to such a market failure and how we can re-establish efficiency. Quick disclaimer, I do not legally allow this content to be published without my consent. If I see this content uploaded anywhere on the web bus but on this canvas page, I will take the content down and I will report whoever uploaded it. So I'll start the lecture with externalities. So I will go over the definition. I will go over a couple of examples. Then I will show how the market will fail to reach a Pareto efficient allocation in the presence of externalities. I will go over the case of bargaining and cost theorem. So those are cases where some externality problems can be solved through bargaining. In particular, cost theorem is going to give us some insight on how the um, efficient equilibrium can be reached in the presence of externalities. Then I will switch to public goods. So I'll start with some definition and with some examples. Then I'll go over the provision of a public good, as in how should the public good or a public good be provided? What is the efficient provision of a public good? And I will talk about various considerations around the provision of public goods. Namely, I will talk about the free riding problem and I will talk about how um, asking for people for their willingness to pay is not incentive compatible. But first, let's start with externalities. An externality is a side effect or a consequence of a market activity, be it production or consumption, that is not reflected in the price or costs, nor taken into account by the market. A couple of things are important here. First of all, an externality is a consequence of a market decision. So if you decide to buy something, there might be some externalities. If a firm decides to produce something, there might be some externalities. Now, those consequences are called externalities if they are not either reflected in the price or in the costs, or more generally, if they are not taken into account by the market. So all the consequences of your market activities that are somehow taken into account by the market, maybe through a change in the costs or a change in the uh, price levels, is not counted as an externality. In general, we talk about externalities when our own market decisions have an impact on people who have no idea about what we did and who did not take part in um, our decision. We distinguish negative externalities and, and positive externalities. A negative externality represents an external cost. It is a cost that falls on people other than those that pursue the activity or are part of the transaction. For instance, think about smoking. It is a negative consumption externality. If you are a smoker and you decide to buy a pack of cigarettes, the consumption of these cigarettes might create externalities. It might have an impact on people around you through secondhand smoking. So if you happen to consume your cigarettes next to somebody else, then we are in the presence of a negative externality. The bystander did not take part in your transaction. When you bought your cigarettes, bystanders had no, um, no say in it. However, if you smoke close enough to them, they are going to suffer from secondhand smoking while not having asked for anything in the first place. So this, although smoking will 
provide you with some utility, it will decrease the utility of people around you, and those people are not being compensated for this disutility. In terms of production externality, a negative production externality could be pollution. Pollution affects the quality of the air that everyone, including other people than the driver, breathe. So here, actually, I'm talking about a consumption externality, sorry, where the driver is consuming gasoline for his car. But you could as well extend this to the case of a factory rejecting, rejecting pollutants during the production process. If you decide to drive your car and come to campus, then I will suffer from a lower air quality due to the pollution of your car. However, I did not take part in your purchase of gasoline and you're not giving me a dollar or two to compensate me for breathing worse air. Same with production. We don't uh, we are not being compensated if a firm has its plant or its factory near your house and is rejecting pollutants, or maybe it's polluting the uh, nearby water supply. Overfishing is also another type of externality. So if you decide to fish in a common resource that everybody can use, let's say you decide to go to a lake like Deer Lake, Trout Lake, here in Vancouver and Burnaby. If you do not take into account the impact of your fishing activity on others, then you're going to create a negative externality. The idea is that when you fish, you reduce the available amount of fish in the lake. So you are, um, let's say, causing harm or an inconvenience to bystanders and bystanders are not being compensated for being able to fish less fish because of you. In general, tragedy of the commons is a problem that happens when people are allowed to use a common resource. If they do not think about the effect they can have on others, they are going to consume until they are personally satisfied, which in general leads to an overuse of the resource. A very easy example, imagine a field of grass in the countryside that belongs to the city. The city is not cultivating or growing anything on this piece of grass, so they are opening this um, land for use by farmers. So farmers are allowed to bring their cattle and they can, they can make their sheep graze on that field of grass. Well, the more sheep there are on the field, the less uh, the less there will be to graze for additional sheep, correct? However, farmers will only think about the impact of, um, will not think about their impact on other farmers. They will only care about bringing as many sheep as possible because they can graze for free. The result is farmers will come with too many sheep at the end of the day. There are going to be too many sheep on the grass. So there will be um, there won't be enough grass to be grazed by the cattle. So when resource is common, public, and free, people tend to overuse it because they don't consider the impact of their consumption on bystanders. If farmers thought about it and they said, "Wait, there are many farmers in um, in the town." I want to leave some grass for them as well, so I'm only going to bring five sheep instead of ten. Often, agents do not um, take that into account, which lead to an inefficient number of sheep grazing on the field. Or overfishing. If we are talking about a positive externality, we are talking about an external benefit. So that would be a benefit received by people other than those that pursue the activity or are part of the transaction. So this would be the reverse. Your decision or a firm's decision has a positive impact on bystanders, but the firm or yourself 
are not being compensated for making the life of, um, of those around you better. Something as silly as gardening creates uh, positive externalities. If you decide to grow your garden, well, if this is a garden that everybody can see, not only you will be happy from having a nice garden, that's why you grew a garden in the first place. But bystanders are also going to enjoy the view when they walk by your house. However, those bystanders are not giving you any money to compensate you for growing such a nice garden. You grew it for yourself, but you're making other people's life nicer. Vaccination. Pretty trendy topic, isn't it? If you get vaccinated, it reduces the probability of getting sick for other people because it reduces the probability of you getting sick. And if you do get sick, it shortens the duration of, um, of your condition. You might be sick for maybe two days instead of a whole week if you get the flu or if you get the, if you catch the coronavirus. So getting a flu shot is not only good for you, but also for those around you. They can also feel safer because now that you have the shot, they might feel a bit more comfortable hanging out with you. However, when you decided to go get a vaccine and I believe the coronavirus vaccine is uh, free. So I will think about the flu shot or other uh, vaccines that you have to pay for. Nobody pays you to get the vaccine. You pay it yourself. So this is a positive externality and you're not getting compensated for um, making the life of those around you nicer. Education, be it its production or uh, consumption. So either the production of education or its consumption, the production of knowledge and the consumption of knowledge help bystanders without them asking for anything. Education expands knowledge, which bystanders are going to benefit from, although they never paid for it. Imagine an extreme case, but imagine that you're uh, in med school. Obviously, you're not. You're doing econ. But if you're in med school, well, first of all, who's going to benefit from your services? Yes, your patients. But there is a market activity for that. There is a price. Patients pay for a certain price. There's a market. Where there are positive externalities is when you can diagnose something for your family. You are probably going to give them a free consultation or your friends. If your friends tell you, oh, I've been having a headache in the past couple days, I've been eating this, eating that, uh, and so on, those are my blood tests, what do you say? Then they would get a consultation for free from you. Those are positive externalities. But you don't need to necessarily need to be a doctor to uh, make the life of people around you better. The fact that you have education in general means that you have more knowledge and you can improve your own life quality as well as those around you by spreading some knowledge. If you do some economics, you we are going maybe you're going to learn something about making investments or the stock market or financial economics in general, that might give you some knowledge that you can spread to the rest of your family and advise them um, to make some investments. The production of knowledge, the creation that comes from research and development is also going to improve the life of everybody, although many people will not pay for the actual production of that research, of that uh, knowledge in the first place. Another interesting one, which in fact is more uh, relevant than one might think at the beginning, bee farming. So bee farming consists in having a couple of beehives or couple of or many and have bees come back and forth to the beehive, go to some flowers and 
do their pollination work. It turns out that bee farming creates positive production externalities. The pollination activity of bees improves nearby orchard yields. So if there is an orchard nearby, like apple trees or any sort of fruits being grown close to a bee farm, the activity of bees is going to um, is going to favor the orchard yields. In fact, it's just a, it's a it's a biological phenomenon that um, when bees are uh, doing their work, I believe that some of the pollen, some of the nectar they gather from flowers, spreads out along the way, and that improves the yields of crops. The beekeeper is not going to get any money from the farmer, the one who's growing apple trees and so on, for having uh, his bees work um, on those apple trees. Now, externalities cause market failure, as in the market fails to reach the Pareto efficient outcome. So what we're going to see now is what is the market equilibrium if there are externalities and why is it inefficient? The idea is that individuals who consider only their own cost and benefit will tend to engage too much in activities that generate negative externalities and of course too little in activities that generate positive externalities. Typically a smoker will smoke too much compared to what is socially optimal. What I mean by socially optimal is, if you decide to smoke, since you're going to affect the well-being of somebody else, somebody nearby, then socially speaking, you need to take into account your utility and the bystander's utility. Because the bystander's utility is going to decrease from your smoking, the equilibrium will be inefficient. It is the same in the case of a positive externality. If you take into account the well-being of others, then you should engage in more, you should engage more in activities that generate positive externalities. I'll give you an example, the vaccine shot, the flu shot. The flu is not something that personally I fear. I think I got the flu once in my life and it lasted half a day and I was like, that's it? Okay, it's not much. I'm not the kind of person who gets sick very often. So if you tell me that I have to pay $20 for a flu shot every year, I'm thinking, nope, no need. But if I take into account the fact that when I get the vaccine shot, I am increasing the utility of people around me, then it becomes socially efficient that I get the vaccine as opposed to not. So, in the presence of externalities, the equilibrium in competitive markets is no longer Pareto efficient. Let's look at this on a graph. First of all, those graphs depict quantity and price, and they depict SMC and PMC, which are social marginal cost and private marginal cost. SMB is the social marginal benefit. You can look at SMB as being a demand curve that gathers everybody, like an aggregate demand curve. Private marginal cost would be the supply curve of firms in general. And the social marginal cost is the marginal cost of firms plus the extra cost that the rest of society might have to incur due to the production of that good. So the labels are a bit different from what we did last week, but the idea is the same. It's a supply demand diagram. Although here, since we have a negative production externality, the real cost, the real marginal cost of producing a good is higher than just the cost the firm has to pay. Think about, for instance, 
producing something like uh, Nutella. I don't know if this is still the case anymore, but Nutella for the longest time um, was composed of palm oil. I think it's still the case. So to get palm oil, Nutella had to um, grow palm trees. That would lead to a lot of deforestation in Brazil in particular, of the Amazon forest, which is a huge cost for the rest of the world, and in particular to um, the Brazilian population. The idea is that Nutella does not take into account the extra cost of polluting or, of, or deforesting the Amazon forest. The only thing they care about is how much they need to pay to get this palm oil into their buckets and to start making Nutella. In this case, the actual marginal cost of making Nutella is higher than just the marginal cost that uh, Ferrero, which is the company that makes Nutella, has to incur. So let's look at the right graph first. The right graph shows what we call the socially efficient equilibrium. This is the Pareto efficient equilibrium. This is Pareto efficient because the social marginal cost meets the social marginal benefit here. So P star Q star is gonna be the socially efficient equilibrium. Now, since Nutella does not take into account, or Ferrero, does not take into account this extra cost the world has to pay, what is actually going to happen on the market is that the SMB curve is going to cross the PMC curve, the private marginal cost. This is supply is equal to demand when Nutella is totally ignoring the impact of growing palm oil on the ecosystem. So PMQM will be the market price and quantity. Note that at P star Q star, we get this blue triangle for consumer surplus and this red triangle for producer surplus. Ignore the green area for now. I'm going to get there uh, in a minute. Cheers. The left graph shows the market equilibrium. So at the market equilibrium, we are at PMQM. Now, what are the different surpluses at the market equilibrium? First of all, at this market equilibrium, QM is higher than Q star because it's a negative externality. So there's going to be too much production of the good that generates negative externalities. The quantity is high and the price is lower. So consumers are actually going to enjoy this big blue triangle. Note that here inside, it is still consumer surplus, which is why I put a plus here. And you can see that this blue triangle overlaps with a red triangle. That's why you have a purplish color here. But this triangle here represents is a part of positive consumer surplus. Now, the interesting part is the producer surplus. The price is PM. If I want to look at producer surplus, I need to look at the social curve. Every time I will look at consumer or producer surplus, I need to look at the social curves, not the private ones. Okay. Look at the private marginal cost as being only Ferrero and the social marginal cost as being the supply of all the firms in the world. So I also need to take into account those of the firms when I compute producer surplus. Note that on this tiny red triangle, the price is higher than the marginal cost, the social marginal cost. 
So this represents a positive surplus. Price is higher than the cost, profit, and so on and so forth. But after this particular point here, then the social marginal cost, so the marginal cost, the true marginal cost of producing Nutella is bigger than the price at which Nutella is going to be sold. So this surplus here becomes negative. It represents a loss because the cost is now higher than the benefit, the benefit being the price. So this red triangle represents a negative surplus, which is why I label a minus here and a minus here. Now, note that I have two areas which overlap. In this purplish triangle, I have a positive consumer surplus and a negative producer surplus. So the minus and the plus are going to cancel out. So you can imagine that at the end of the day, this purplish triangle is white. We have this triangle left here, which is a net negative surplus. Now, let's compare the two graphs. On the right graph, the total surplus is given by this big triangle, which is consumer surplus plus producer surplus. On the left hand side, I have this blue part here, not taking into account the purplish triangle because they cancel out. I have this tiny bit of producer surplus, which is positive. So for now, this triangle is exactly the same triangle as this one, except that consumers have a bit more surplus in this one. But in terms of area, the area is the same. Now, if you look at the left graph, there is one chunk that we did not take into account, which is the minus chunk here. So the final surplus, the final total surplus under the market equilibrium is going to be this big triangle minus this triangle. In the socially efficient case, the total surplus is only this triangle. Now, if you take the difference between the two areas, you end up with a net negative surplus here with this triangle. And this triangle here is what I represented in green here, and I called it the dead weight loss. It is a dead weight loss because those units are being produced, although the marginal cost of producing this good at the world level the world scale, is higher than the price consumers are willing to pay. Those units are still being sold because at the market equilibrium, the price is at PM. It is a lower price. Nutella does not, or Ferrero, does not take into account this extra cost here. So this green triangle represents a too much of a quantity too high of a quantity that should not be produced nor consumed. Any questions? This is a very important part of the lecture. You need to understand where those different surpluses are coming from. So let me know in the chat. So Nutella does not care about the external marginal cost, yes, but the idea is that the producer surplus as a whole is going to include Nutella, but also other producers. And the production of Nutella is going to increase the cost to other producers through deforestation. Which is why when I look at producer surplus as a whole, 
I need to include Nutella, but also all the other ones. So I need to look at the social marginal cost curve. Both of these graphs have a negative externality. The left graph is what happens if you leave the market on its own. In this case, the private curves are going to cross. PMC and SMB, which is also PMB here. Social marginal benefit is the same thing as private marginal benefit. When I eat my Nutella, I have no impact on anybody whatsoever. The right graph shows what happens if, uh, what happens at the socially efficient equilibrium. The socially efficient equilibrium maximizes total surplus. This is the Pareto efficient equilibrium. Unfortunately, Nutella does not take into account its impact on the rest of the world. So what you're going to see is actually the left graph with PMQM. That quantity is too high. Because it's too high compared to Q star, that result in an inefficiency. And the area minus here represents the net difference between total surplus on the left and total surplus on the right. So at the end of the day, the only change is going to be in the deadweight loss. But you need to understand what the different price and quantities are in each case. The right graph is what we would like to see ideally. Problem is, in real life, Ferrero is not going to take into account its imp the impact of its production on the rest of the world. So what we're going to see in real life is the left-hand side with a deadweight loss. It is inefficient, so the government should step in and try to solve it one way or another. So, going back to the left graph, somebody asked me about the different areas. Remember that producer surplus is the difference between the price at which the good is sold at and the price at which producers are willing to sell the good at. On this tiny triangle, the price is higher than the cost. So, the price received by firms is higher than the cost the firms overall are willing to sell the good for. So it's a positive surplus. Once you cross this point, a jar of Nutella is more expensive to produce in terms of ferrous costs plus environmental costs. It is more costly to produce than what it is being sold for. So that's why this area becomes negative because the cost becomes higher than the price. So this whole triangle becomes negative. Because consumers enjoy a higher quantity and a lower price on the left graph, their consumer surplus is pretty big. And now you can see that two areas overlap. Some positive consumer surplus here, which at the same time is a source of negative surplus for producers. So this purplish triangle, at the end of the day, cancels out. The positive consumer surplus cancels out, cancels the um, negative producer surplus. But there is a negative surplus chunk here left, and this will constitute the dead weight loss. Okay, so I talked about production versus consumption externalities and positive versus negative. So we're going to have two subcases for each type of externality. If you have positive externalities, we're going to look at consumption externalities. In this case, the social marginal benefit is bigger than the private marginal benefit. Getting a flu shot increases not only my utility, but also the utility of others around me. So, if I take into account everybody's utility, it is higher than just my own. 
If it's a production externality, since it is positive, it means that, socially speaking, the marginal cost of producing the good is lower than the private marginal cost of producing the good. Bee farming, for instance. So, if you think about the social, uh, the private marginal cost of uh, making honey, if you take into account the fact that the cost of the other firm decreased thanks to the, your bees' activity, then the social marginal cost will be lower than the private marginal cost. We will also have two subcases for negative externalities. If it's a consumption externality, it means that, socially speaking, there is a lower benefit than the private marginal benefit. If you smoke a cigarette and get a utility of 5, you on your own, your private marginal benefit is equal to 5, whatever 5 means. If you take into account the fact that somebody next to you is suffering from passive smoking, and maybe his or her utility will decrease by 1, minus 1, then the social marginal benefit will be 5 minus 1, which is 4. And 4 is lower than 5. Because smoking annoys the person next to you, the overall demand for cigarettes, and I say overall, I mean if you take into account the bystander's preferences with you, the demand will be lower than if it's only you who is um, asking for cigarettes. If it's a production externality, the social marginal cost is bigger than the private marginal cost. And I just gave the example of Nutella. Any food that uses palm oil, pretty much. I'm going back to the graph to answer a question from the chat. The market equilibrium is going to be PMQM here. This is what is going to happen if nobody takes externalities into account. And in general, this is what happens. When you decide to buy gasoline, you're not taking into account the fact that you're polluting and that you're, that you're uh, decreasing the quality of air for, for people around you. So you just look at the equilibrium price and consume the corresponding quantity. What is socially efficient though is the point P star Q star. This is where we would like to get. Unfortunately, this is where we and we unfortunately we are at PMQM if we leave agents do their own thing. Let's put some um, let's make a model. Okay? Let's put some numbers on those graphs. So imagine you have two roommates, Rick and May. Rick smokes. So, if it's a smoker, you can already see it coming. It is going to be a negative consumption externality. Imagine they each have an income equal to I. If Rick, sorry, it should be an R, not an S, consumes Q cigarettes, here are the utility functions. Rick has utility UR equal to 4 times square root of Q plus money. You can see that the higher the Q, the higher the utility because Rick enjoys smoking. May, however, does not enjoy Rick smoking and in fact, she is suffering from secondhand smoking. You can see it in her, um, in her utility. Her utility is equal to minus 0.5 Q plus money. So, ideally, she would like Rick to smoke zero cigarette. That would maximize her utility. Sorry about Harry. Uh, what I meant here is May. So, Q affects the utility of May in a negative way. Imagine the price of cigarettes is one to make things easy. Then money 
for, so it's not Sally, it's Rick. I have to change the names. Money is going to be equal to income minus money spent on cigarettes, P times Q. Since P is equal to 1, money overall will be equal to I minus Q. If Rick is just looking for cigarettes on its own and doesn't take into account the impact of smoking on May, then he's going to take his first order condition. And you end up with the utility maximizing consumption for REC is going to be four cigarettes. This is what satisfies this first order condition. Now, imagine that there was no externality. Imagine that instead of cigarettes, Rick was consuming candy bars. And he says that his optimal consumption of candy bars, it could be a week or something, is equal to four candy bars. Since him eating candy bars does not have any impact on May's utility, then those four candy bars would also be the efficient, um, the efficient equilibrium. Now, because May is suffering from the consumption of cigarettes by Rick, this, for, this solution of four cigarettes is not efficient anymore. Rick did not take May's utility into account. Let's look at the Pareto efficient or the socially op optimal quantity. To do this, maximize both utilities together, one plus the other. So, total utility will be the, ut the utility of Rick plus the utility of May. 4 times square root of Q plus I minus Q minus 0.5 Q plus I. Note that now in this utility function, minus 0.5 Q shows up. So once I take the first order condition, I'm going to have an extra minus 0.5 in my derivative. Okay, somebody is asking me to go back to the previous slide. So, here I am looking at the amount of cigarettes that Rick will want to consume. So Rick is going to maximize his utility. His utility is equal to 4 times square root of Q plus money. If you replace money by the budget, then you can take the first derivative with respect to Q and you obtain this first order condition. This minus one here is coming from the one in front of minus Q. In this case, Rick finds that four cigarettes is the optimal amount of cigarettes to smoke let's say, during a day. It is not efficient because he did not take into account the negative impact of his own consumption on May. So, note that in the utility of May, Q is not the amount of cigarettes she smokes, it is the amount of cigarettes that Rick is going to smoke. May does not smoke, but she suffers from passive smoking if Rick smokes. So now let's look at what's happening if both utilities are maximized together. Now that they're maximized together, you can see that four square root of Q plus I minus Q shows up like the previous slide, but now you have to add the utility of May and May's utility contains minus 0.5q. If you take the derivative, you get the same first order condition as before, but the minus one will not be alone. Now, there's going to be a minus 0.5 due to the disutility that May experiences. Now, if you solve, 
you get that Q is roughly equal to 2. It's a round off. I believe it's something like 1.7777777. If your activity has an impact on somebody else, the socially efficient solution will be where you take that into account and you include it in your utility maximization problem one way or another. So what's going to happen graphically? Graphically, we have PMB, the private marginal benefit. This is the demand coming from REC. Imagine that instead of one, we had a price equal to P. Then you would have P here that you can take to the other side. And that gives you the demand for cigarettes coming from Rick alone. Now, the social marginal benefit takes into account everybody's marginal utility, not only Rick's. May also has a marginal utility, which is equal to minus 0.5. So, the social marginal benefit here is a shifted version of the, the private marginal benefit. It is just 0.5 lower than PMB. So, at any point, pick any Q on the, on the x-axis, the vertical distance between PMB and SMB will always be 0.5 because this is the external damage incurred by May. Note that Rick, if he doesn't take into account May's utility, will consume cigarettes such that private marginal benefit is equal to the private marginal cost. Here, the private marginal cost is equal to one. This is the price of one cigarette or one pack of cigarettes. So QPRIV will be the result find before for cigarettes. At this quantity, you can compute consumer surplus. But remember, to compute consumer surplus, you have to look at all the consumers overall. So you're going to look at the social marginal benefit curve. This will be the area under the curve all the way here. But since QPRIV is being consumed, we're going to go all the way there. However, note that beyond Q star, the private marginal cost is higher than the social marginal benefit, which is why you end up with this dead weight loss. If instead you, are, you stop at the socially efficient quantity Q star, then the consumer surplus will be this whole area. So the difference between this area and this area minus this area will be this area, the dead weight loss. The private marginal cost, it depends on the situation. So here, we are not looking at a supply. We're not looking at Philip Morris and so on and so forth. We take the price as given. It's equal to a certain amount. We are looking at the consumer side only. So we have to look at what the marginal cost represents to a consumer. Here, the marginal cost is buying one extra pack of cigarettes, which costs $1. So it really depends on how the problem is being framed. But here, we don't need to know the supply of uh, the cigarette producers. We are just looking at consumers. The price is taken as given. It's equal to $1. And if Rick does not take into account May's utility, Rick is going to smoke too much. Too much as in, it will not be 
it will not maximize total surplus. So, if you take into account SMB, the place where SMB crosses PMC will be the market, the sorry, the socially efficient quantity, Q star. This is given by this computation here. If you forget about the minus 0.5, you have the exact same first order condition as the previous slide. 2 over square root of Q minus 1. 1 represents the marginal cost. 2 over square root of Q represents the marginal utility or the marginal benefit of RIC. So when you put the minus 1 to the other side, you get private marginal benefit equals private marginal cost. Now, if you take into account maze utility, you have the minus, one, minus 0.5 uh, on top of it. So the minus 1 will go to the right-hand side. That's still the private marginal cost. This is how much it costs to buy one cigarette. But the social marginal benefit is now equal to the private marginal benefit from Rick plus the private marginal benefit from May. Well, it's not really a private marginal uh, benefit because it's a, it's a minus, but you add both, you add the two private marginal benefits to obtain the social marginal benefit. Somebody asks in the chat, what this derivation tells? What derivation? Please try to be precise in the chat. No, precisely. If Rick, if Rick does not take into account maze utility, it is not Pareto efficient. QPRIV is not Pareto efficient. Q star is Pareto efficient. This is the derivative of the utility with respect to Q. This is the first order condition. This is the problem that Rick is going to solve to find the optimal amount of cigarettes to smoke. 4 square root of Q, if you take the derivative of that, you obtain 2 over square root of Q priv. Is it clear for everyone? It is just a first order condition. Think about econ 201. Same thing. So, Rick is consuming too many cigarettes. Instead of QPRIV, he should consume Q star, which is roughly equal to 2. So he should cut his uh, cigarette consumption by 50% if he wants to maximize total surplus. So, the private marginal benefit is only Rick's marginal utility. That's 2 over square root of Q. That's what I showed two slides ago. The social marginal benefit adds both May and Rick's marginal utilities. So it's going to be 2 over square root of Q minus 0.5. Which is why SMB is a shifted version of PMB. It is lower by 0.5 at each Q. Here the difference is 0.5. Here the difference is 0.5. Here the difference is 0.5. And so on. Minus 0.5 here is called the marginal external damage. Since it is constant, SMB is a downward shift of PMB. It turns out the marginal benefit, the marginal uh, external damage is not always a constant. I might have some disutility from secondhand smoking on the first cigarette, but if you make me second secondhand smoke on 20 cigarettes, then my utility is going to get way worse. It's not going to be just 20 times the disutility of one cigarette because I really don't want to accumulate secondhand smoking. Remember, the one here 
is not part of the utility. The one here is part of the budget constraint. This one here is the private marginal cost. This is what, this is what goes to the other side. The marginal utility is the, der is the derivative of this thing, just this, with respect to Q. Is it clear? Okay. So, what can happen here? Well, there's a dead weight loss. May wishes that Rick was smoking less. Rick maybe doesn't care and is just um, consuming an amount Q prive of cigarettes. But, which graph do you want me to explain? Can you be more precise? I have like three or four graphs. This one. Okay. So again, we have the private marginal benefit here where the private marginal benefit meets the private marginal cost of one is this condition here. This condition will uh, show the optimal amount of cigarettes to smoke by Rick. This is where they cross this point here and you get Q priv. Now, if Rick took into account his, the damage he, he, um, he causes on May, then the optimal amount of cigarettes would be where the social marginal benefit meets the private marginal cost here. And that would give you Q star. Q star is efficient because total surplus under Q star is higher than total surplus under Q prime. Under Q star, total surplus is equal to this area under the blue curve and above the red line until you get to Q star. But under Q prime, the total surplus is equal to that area minus that area. Why minus? Because the social marginal benefit is now lower than the cost of cigarettes. The producer surplus uh, doesn't really matter here. There is no such thing as producer surplus. It is not really zero. The price of cigarettes is one, but maybe the producer is um, maybe the producer's real cost of production is lower than one. I'm not sure to understand the last comment in the chat. The consumer surplus is not negative. Only that part is negative, but that whole part is positive. Q prime is not Pareto efficient. It's Q star. Precisely because there is a negative surplus here, Q prime will not be Pareto efficient. Q star is Pareto efficient. In the case of, I don't understand the question about the case of PMB. Every time you compute a surplus, you have to look at the social curves because the social curves take into account everyone, not just Rick, not just me, but both together. And this is what we look at. So every time you have to compute a surplus, you have to consider the social curves. If you want to compute the dead weight loss, then here you will need to compute the area between the private marginal cost and the social marginal benefit between the optimal quantity and the non-optimal one. Here, however, 
you can see that it's curved. So if you want to compute this area thoroughly, then you might need to use other techniques than just computing an area. You might need to use something called integrals. At Q prime, consumer surplus is not zero. Again, consumer surplus is this whole area here minus that area. Nothing says that this area and this area are equal and they cancel out. Maybe this one is higher. Maybe this one is lower. The whole point is that in the case of Q prime, the consumer surplus is this area minus this area. And in the case of Q star, the total surplus, the consumer surplus, is just this area. So when we are at Q star, the consumer surplus is higher. And Q star is efficient. Any other questions about this? Okay, so what can happen here? The actual solution, the current solution, is not efficient. Rick is consuming too many cigarettes. That bothers May. And overall, total surplus could be higher, but it is not. The social marginal benefit is the sum here, look at this point, is the sum of both private marginal benefits. You just add marginal utilities together. So it turns out that gains from trade exist. So May and Rick might be able to reach some sort of agreement that will make somebody better off without making the other one worse off. Rick and May, for instance, could negotiate an agreement, some sort of a contract, where maybe May compensates Rick for not smoking. So May tells Rick, hey, I'm going to pay you some money. And in exchange, you don't smoke four packs of cigarettes. You only smoke two, which is efficient. Or it could be the other way around. Instead of May paying Rick not to smoke, Rick could pay May to be, to be allowed to smoke. So in this case, Rick is going to compensate May for being allowed to smoke, but because he has to pay an extra cost to be able to smoke, he won't decide to smoke four packs of cigarettes. He will smoke less. The general idea is that the efficient solution can be found using some bargaining. Imagine the case where you smoke in the street. The bystander could come to you and say, either you pay me to, uh, either you pay me and I let you smoke, or uh, I pay you and you don't smoke. Depending on who has the property rights, who has the right to smoke in the first place or not, that uh, will give you one solution over the other. If Rick pays May, so somebody asks if Rick can pay May enough to smoke the original Q is equal to four. The idea is that if Rick is paying May to consume cigarettes, he's gonna have to pay an extra cost on top of paying for the cigarettes. So not only he has the cigarettes, he brings them home, but then he has to pay an extra cost to May for each cigarette he wants to smoke. Because of the extra cost, he will not have an incentive to smoke Q is equal to four. He will want to stay at two. Beyond two cigarettes, it's gonna to become too expensive. That will be the idea, yes. So either Rick buys a cigarette and asks, pays May to be able to smoke. So it makes each cigarette 
more expensive to consume because not only the rig needs to pay uh, for the cigarettes, but also he needs to pay May to be allowed to smoke. The other way is Rick could have his cigarettes with him, but he might accept to give up on some cigarettes if he gets paid for it. May will not pay Rick to smoke zero cigarettes because that might be too expensive for May. Rather, May will pay some amount in the middle so that Rick, instead of smoking four packs of cigarettes, will only smoke two. And this is the general conclusion of Coe's theorem. People can arrive at an efficient solution to the problem of externalities by negotiating the purchase and the sale of the legal right to engage in the activities that cause the externality. In particular, the efficient solution, for example, Q star in the previous example, may not depend on who has the property rights. It may not depend on who has the right to tell the other they can do whatever they want. What I said before is May can compensate Rick to smoke less. In this case, Rick has the property rights. He's the one who can smoke. The other way around would be the case where Rick pays May to smoke. In this case, May is the one in charge. She has the property rights. She's like, my home, you don't smoke. Ah, if you give me some money, I may maybe I will allow you to smoke a bit. Or it could be the other way around, where Rick says, my place, I smoke if I want to. If you don't want me to smoke, you're going to have to pay me some money. And maybe I will decide to smoke less. And this is what is going to happen. The idea is that as long as property rights are clearly defined, bargaining can lead agents back to the um, socially efficient outcome. The question in the chat says, we assume that Rick consumes zero quantity if he didn't compensate May, right? Yes, in this case, that would be the case. If May is in charge and she says no smoking in the house, then by default, Rick is not allowed to smoke. If he wants to smoke, maybe he has to pay May for that. But it all depends on who has the property right in the first place. So, how things are going to happen depends on who has the rights or who is in charge. But getting to the efficient solution doesn't depend on who is in charge. If Rick is in charge, May compensates him. Boom, efficient solution. If May is in charge, Rick pays May to smoke. Boom, efficient solution again. So. The efficient solution may not depend on who has the property rights. Who gains and who loses will depend on who has the property rights. If May is in charge and she makes the rules, she's going to be the one getting money from Rick. If Rick is the one making the rules, then May is going to be the one giving money away to Rick. But what's important is that property rights are clearly defined. This result is very vague, and Ronald Coase got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1991 for such a result. But the idea is that the problem of externalities can be solved to some extent through bargaining. And if you think about things such as roommates or a local firm producing next to a house or a neighbor's quarrel about making noise at night and things like that, then you can think of all of these cases of externalities as being um, solvable through bargaining. Maybe I, maybe I misspoke. If Rick is in charge, he's not going to compensate May. If Rick is in charge, May is the one who has to pay Rick for Rick to smoke less. Sorry if I misspoke. 
pretty much here in this case whoever is in charge is gonna receive the money so you can generalize this to many problems like um, neighbors in your unit maybe there is a bylaw that says that after 10 p.m. Um, any resident of a given condo should be pretty uh, quiet right that's one of the standard thing from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. or something in general uh, there's a rule like that maybe some uh, some neighbor is actually making noise after 11 p.m. maybe for the time being you cannot reach the residential tenancy agreement or uh, you cannot reach whoever is in charge in the condo so maybe you can just knock at the roommate's door and say hey can you make less noise you're not supposed to you're not supposed to make that much noise right now and if the guy says I don't care maybe there could be some bargaining you could maybe pay or find other ways for him to um, quiet down Somebody says that if Rick does not abide by May demands as she is the property owner, he would assumingly be kicked out. Why do you assume so? How would that socially efficient equilibrium show as? Well, you're adding another rule on top of the model. Here, I'm just saying they have to live together. There are two roommates, period. Maybe they are uh, in charge, but maybe they cannot enforce those things well. They cannot kick somebody out for just smoking on the property, for instance. What I'm saying is that the assumption that somebody would get kicked out and so on and so forth is just making the model more complicated than it needs to be. Here, the intuition is straightforward. Rick is smoking too much from a socially point of view. He should smoke less. How can this happen? Bargaining. Depending on who is making the rules, bargaining will go one way or another. Somebody is going to compensate somebody else. And at the end of the day, the efficient solution can be reached. If the bylaws cannot be enforced, then the property rights are pretty much in the hands of the one making the noise. If the guy is making noise, but he doesn't have the right to make noise technically, but says, I don't care, you cannot call the, land, the, the landlords right now, then technically he's kind of like in charge. He's kind of making the rule by breaking it. But what I'm saying is, if property rights are not clearly defined, the compensation thing is going to be a problem. Who is going to compensate who? Who has the right to do what? The idea is that this is going to get in the way of the socially efficient bargaining. And what's interesting about this theorem is that it's very powerful, yet it fails all the time. Not all the time, of course not, but it fails quite a lot. So the theorem holds a very powerful intuition, but Getting to a socially efficient solution through cohesion bargaining can be uh, a problem many, many times. In particular, because they are what we call transaction costs. Total cost of making a transaction, including planning, bargaining, deciding, resolving disputes, enforcing, and so on. I can give you a clear example of that. My previous landlady had a problem with me having a guest. The residency tenancy agreement, the RTA, in British Columbia states that tenants are allowed to have guests without having to warn the landlords for at least uh, or for at most two weeks or something like that. The idea is that if it's a guest, the guest can stay as long as it doesn't look like the guest is living. So if the guest is staying for more than two weeks or a month, maybe it looks like somebody is staying at your place although you are supposed to be the only tenant. Under that threshold, you are free to have as many guests as you want as long as you respect the bylaws, such as uh, not making noise after 10 p.m. and so on and so forth. When I told my landlady, oh, uh, actually I didn't even tell her once, my friend came, 
but his luggage was held off at the airport because I think he was in another plane. At the airport, he put my address for his luggage to be delivered whenever it gets to the airport. Since I, live, since I was living in the basement the next day or two days later, so my friend came, we hang out and everything. Two days later, my landlady comes to me and says, I got some luggage for you. And I said, oh, that's my guest. That's my, my friend's luggage. I came to pick up the luggage and she said, you didn't tell me you had a guest. I said, I'm not supposed to. That's in the bylaws. I can do whatever I want. It's a guest. He's not staying with me for a month. It's not my roommate or anything like that. So I am in my right. And she said, you didn't warn me. So we are going to charge you $30 per night he stays. So that sounds a lot like a WTF to me. I was like, what? <laughs> That's absurd. He's going to stay for two weeks. I'm going to have to pay 14 times $30. Like, doesn't make sense. It's almost paying like a full second rent if it had stayed for two more weeks. So then I said, I'm pretty sure I didn't have to warn you. And she said, but you wrote it in the lease. I said, yeah, in the lease at the beginning, you told me that you were, that you allowed me to have a guest, but in general, I'm allowed to have guests. I pulled up the, the tenancy agreement and I showed to her and I said, look, those are the bylaws. Just before showing them, I said, don't worry, I'm gonna need, I'm, I need to know what the rules are. And once we know what the rules are, we can figure out if what I'm doing is right or, and so on. Before that, she said, no, no, I don't want to get into this. I don't want to get into this. This is a transaction cost. If somebody doesn't want to get into the bargaining process, into knowing the rules, into knowing who is in charge, into knowing who has the right to do what, then the bargaining is going to fail. So I still got my tenancy agreement. I came to them and I said, here it is, read. If you're not happy with it, we're going to call the referee. There is a referee. There is a whole process of calling a referee who's going to decide who is in the right. Eventually, she read the rules and said, OK, I agree. But you cannot say you cannot stay for more than that much time. I said, yeah, that's in the bylaws. Beyond a month, too much. I understand. That sounds like you would have to pay for an extra rent and so on. That sounds like a roommate. The idea of transaction costs is that not everybody is willing to take the time to know what the property rights are, know what the rules are, set up a uh, meeting, bargain, and so on and so forth. If you have transaction costs, then the bargaining process will not happen smoothly. And if property rights are missing, in the sense of we don't know who has the right to do what, then bargaining might also fail. This is an easy case. It's you and your roommate, it's neighbors, it's um, colleagues, you know, colleagues doing something in the lounge room at work or I don't know. What happens if you're talking about a market? Like when you consume gasoline, you're not going to go to, uh, the bystander is not going to come to you and say, hey, I'll give you a dollar if you ride your car 50% less every day or something like that. There are no such thing. So when you have actual markets and bigger size, like more actors in the market, many suppliers, many consumers, bargaining will not work. Bargaining is something you do with your brother, with your friend, with your roommate, with your landlord. It's like a bargain is something you do with two or three people at the same time. What if you have millions of people at the same time? Public authorities can step in. Among other things, they can use what we call Pigovian taxes and subsidies. So Pigou, Arthur Cecil Pigou, was a British economist, which among other, um, which in particular was the supervisor of Keynes. You might know Keynes from Econ 105 or Econ 305, the Keynesian multiplier and so on. Pigou was his supervisor. He came up with a uh, form of taxation and subsidy that could solve the problem. The idea is to tax in the case of a negative externality or to grant a subsidy in the case of a positive externality equal to the difference between the private and the social benefit or costs at the socially efficient quantity. 
That second part is very important, and I'm going to show you in, uh, in the next slide uh, what I mean by that. Otherwise, the government could set some quotas. Too much gasoline is being consumed, so the government could ask gas stations to only sell a, only sell a certain amount of gasoline per day or per week. It is in general easier to impose a quota when too much of a good is being consumed, so in the case of negative externalities. It is harder to impose a minimum quantity to produce if it's a positive externality. Another solution is to set up tradable permits and auctions. In the case of uh, big factories, if the production of a good implies negative production externalities such as pollution, those firms could be given a certain amount of units they can pollute. So it's a certain amount of um, CO2 carbon dioxide emissions they allow to produce every year, for instance. Firms who do not uh, use all of their units, so firms who pollute less than what they are allowed to, can resell the extra units to another firm who would like to pollute more. The idea is that this price system can act as uh, like bargaining in the previous slide and that should lead to a more efficient amount of carbon dioxide emissions at the end of the day. The cap and trade system in the US is a system of tradable permits and auctions. Firms are given a certain amount of pollution they are allowed to produce and they can resell the extra amount uh, of pollution they could produce if they don't produce it. That also gives an incentive to some firms uh, to be for some firms to be green in their production process, because this way they will have a lot of extra pollution units they can resell to another firm. Let's look at a Pigovian tax. So we have a negative production externality again. We have social marginal benefit, the demand. We have the private marginal cost and we have the social marginal cost. Note that here, the social marginal cost is not parallel to the private marginal cost. This means that the external damage is not the same depending on your amount of production. If you only produce a little, imagine you're here. I should get out of the way. <laughs> if you only produce this amount, then the external damage is not that big. But the more you produce, maybe, the more pollution it causes but not in the same amount, it produces even more pollution. So that once you produce a high amount like here, the social marginal cost is way higher than the private marginal cost. Now, the idea here is that if you leave firms do their own thing, the market equilibrium will be such that private marginal cost equals social marginal benefit. So we're going to be here. Again, we know it's inefficient. And if you remember the previous graphs, this triangle here would be, will be the dead weight loss. This is extra production that costs more than what people are willing to pay for. Now, the definition of a Pigovian tax says, tax the difference between social marginal cost and private marginal cost at the socially efficient quantity. So once you know your social marginal cost and your social marginal benefit, you can find P 
P star and Q star. And you know that those are the socially efficient quantities and prices. Right? Now, charge a tax exactly equal to the difference between SMC and PMC when you are at Q star. So the tax could be this T here. But this tax is a tax for each unit. It is the same amount per unit, like 50 cents for each unit. So what's going to happen is it is going to raise the private marginal cost of the firm to the orange curve here, PMC plus T. Each unit of the good is going to cost now T dollars more to produce or T cents. Whatever production you are at. So you can see that PMC plus T is parallel to PMC. It turns out that now, if you leave the firms do their own thing on the market, now that they have this extra tax to pay when they produce, the new market equilibrium will be where this new supply, this new PMC plus T, equals the demand. So it's going to be here. And this point turns out to be P star Q star, the efficient price and quantity. So the tax makes PM shift upwards so that now you can just leave the firms do their own thing on the market and it will automatically lead to the socially efficient quantity and prices. It's a pretty powerful insight when you think about it. It's a minimum amount of regulation. You don't need to tell what firms need to do. You just need to impose a tax on the firm. And this will make the firm want to produce the socially efficient quantity and price. It is a very powerful insight when you think about it. In, um, in practice, it is pretty hard to implement. Why do you think that is? Well, in real life, you need to know what the social marginal cost is, you need to know what the private marginal cost is, and you need to know what the social marginal benefit is. Those are curves which are hard to estimate using data. There are multiple problems attached to it, and you would have to find those things for every good that creates externalities, whether they are positive, negative, and so on. If it's a positive externality, this is going to be the other way around. You want firms to produce more. So instead of taxing them, you're going to subsidize them. You're going to give them money on each unit they produce. That will decrease their cost because every time they produce a unit, the government is paying part of this cost. Very nice. That will make firms want to produce, want to produce more of the good stuff, like honey. Okay? Is everything understood here? An example of Pigovian tax is the carbon tax. The carbon tax uh, is equal to, I forgot what it's equal to actually. I could check that online right now. The carbon tax in British Columbia is equal to 45 as of April 1st, 2021 is equal to $45 per ton of CO2 emission. Yeah. So the carbon tax is a tax which is applied on consumers for uh, consuming gasoline, which pollutes, right? And decreases the quality of the air we breathe. The carbon tax is a way to increase the cost of gasoline for us so that 
we might decide to consume less gasoline and maybe take the bus or buy an electric car and so on and so forth. Is this tax enough for the market equilibrium to be equal to the socially efficient equilibrium? This I'm not sure because I don't know exactly what P star and Q star are. I don't know exactly what Q star is, but at least the carbon tax is making us maybe consume a bit less gasoline than we would if there was no tax. So it's already a bit better. And the tax is scheduled to increase even more in the future. So if you um, are using gasoline on a daily basis, maybe you might want to switch to something else or start getting the bus and so on. Any questions about externalities before I move on to public goods? Okay, I don't see any question in the chat. So let's take a break of 10 minutes. I know that you're probably brain fried right now. It's been an hour and a half, a lot of things to unpack. So am I, I am losing my English right now. So I need to regroup. Oh, one question before the break. Society is getting better and gains the welfare from dead weight loss. No, in a case like that, they don't gain the dead weight loss. The dead weight loss is extra negative stuff. So if you are consuming Q star instead, this negative stuff disappears. It's not that now it becomes positive. It's just that the negative stuff disappears. If that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's go to, uh, let's get a break. It's 106 right now. So let's have a break until uh, 10, uh, 116. Okay, 10 minutes. Make yourself some tea. Take a breather.
Okay, I hope everybody's ready. Let's resume the lecture. Oh, where am I? Here. <laughs> People can still see me and read me? See me and hear me? Okay, let's go then. Um, any questions before I move on to public goods? Maybe you have time to digest some of this content for the past 10 minutes. Don't forget, in the problem set, there are plenty of exercises that are looking at externalities and so on and so forth. So you're going to, I think you're going to understand better how things are going to be um, working once you can put your hands on a model. The previous model I showed has this feature that m most models with externalities have is that if what you're doing produces externalities, then it means that somebody else is affected by your consumption. So it means that in the utility of somebody else, what you consume will show up because the more you consume of that thing, the better it is for them if it's a good thing or the worse it is for them if it's a bad thing. So whenever you see, or whenever you think about an externality exercise or a model, you have to think there are externalities if somebody's utility is affected by my consumption. Okay? As I mentioned before, there would not be any externality if May did not have this minus 0.5Q in her utility function. If, for example, Rick smokes outside and he doesn't smell and anything like that, so there is no secondhand smoking, then May's utility would not depend on Rick's consumption of cigarettes and there would not be any externalities. And in fact, in this case, well, the market equilibrium of four packs of cigarettes would be efficient because the surplus, the consumer surplus of everybody from consuming cigarettes in this case would be only the consumer surplus of Rick. May would have zero consumer surplus from the consumption of cigarettes by Rick. Okay, now let's get into public goods. Public goods are a special case of externality where everybody consumes the same amount. It's kind of weird. So, a public good is characterized by two features. The first one is non-rivalry. A good is non-rivalrous, or non-rival, non-rivalrous, I think, if it can be consumed by many people at the same time, or, in other terms, the use by one extra individual does not reduce the availability to others. So, people are not competing, they're not rivals in the consumption of that good. They can both consume that good in the same amount, in the same way. A public good is also a good which is non-excludable. So individuals cannot be excluded from its use. There are only a couple of goods, types of goods, which are purely public goods, which are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. But we're going to see how it leads to market failure. A couple of examples of, pub of such public goods or public services. National defense. If your country is being attacked, chances are, probably, that you will enjoy the intervention of your country's army for your own safety as much as your neighbor. There are cases, of course, where national defense will not do. Think about a case where national defense reaches capacity and the country is being further attacked. But in principle, you and your neighbors will enjoy the protection, of the the protection by the national defense in the same way. Firemen is pretty similar to the extent that not all the firemen are busy. Everybody is going to enjoy the services the same way. 
once you get to the capacity where every fireman is being busy right now, then the good becomes rival. The use by another another person being uh, saved by the fireman will um, will reduce the availability of firemen to other people. Fireworks is another example. If you stand at Canada Place to watch fireworks on Canada Day, on July 1st, um, you and other bystanders will enjoy the fireworks the exact same way. Of course, you could think, you could say, well, if you watch fireworks from downtown, it's going to be different from if you watch fireworks from Burnaby. Yes, but on the principle, you can enjoy fireworks the exact same way. And having one extra person watching fireworks is not going to reduce or not going to uh, threaten your experience of the fireworks. Nature and parks. Everything which is a common resource, which is technically public, is can be considered a public good. If you want to go to a park, you can enjoy the park and an extra user can enjoy the park the same way. In general, of course, that applies. But if nature and parks are already crowded, then not only it could become excludable because maybe there is no space at all in the park, or it could become rivalrous in the sense that if you want to start enjoying the park, maybe other people around you will not be able to enjoy the park as much because now they have to they have less space. Especially in times of social distancing, if everybody has to be social distanced, then you then a park can become rivalrous rather quickly and in fact excludable. But as long as you don't reach capacity, an extra person can enjoy the park as much as the previous ones. Rural highways. Why do I talk about rural? Because in the countryside in general, highways are not congested. If you have ever driven in LA, you're on the highway all day, but you're going to be stuck in traffic all day as well. Highways in Los Angeles are rivalrous. An extra user of the highway is going to reduce the availability of others. And if it is fully congested, then it's going to become excludable and you won't even be able to join in. Inventions are public goods. So the, imagine a case where there is no patent behind the invention. Well, in fact, there could be a patent, it doesn't really matter. But once an invention is being made, everybody can enjoy that idea the same way. So more than inventions, maybe I should say ideas are a public good. You cannot exclude somebody if you make it public. And one extra person knowing about this is not going to decrease the availability of the idea by others. Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 2001, said uh, there was one day he came to my university to give a conference and he said something about um, innovations and inventions and ideas and yeah he mentioned the fact that they are public goods and he mentioned the fact that they are like candles if you have a new idea imagine that one candle is going to be um, lit on with one candle lit on you can light a bunch of other candles so the idea is that once you have one other candles can benefit from that first idea and it will not affect the quality of the first candle. You can literally just spread the flame. Here's a table to give you an idea of the classification of goods. If a good is both rivalrous and excludable, then it is what we call a private good. This is what we know the best. This is what we buy on a daily basis. Our food, our clothing, and so on. We buy it for ourselves. We can exclude others from enjoying our clothes because I am wearing, I'm wearing my clothes. Nobody else can now. When I decide to buy my food and eat it, nobody else can. I can choose to exclude other people. I can always share, right? So this is the standard private good. Now imagine a good which is rivalrous, but 
non-excludable. So you cannot exclude somebody from using the good, but as the number of users increases, it is going to reduce the availability to others. In general, we can think of common pool resources, like fish stocks in a lake, timber, coal. You cannot exclude somebody from enjoying wood in Canada. I'm literally, what, I'm literally looking at a forest in front of me right now. You can go to the lake and enjoy the fish. But as soon as you catch a fish, that reduces the availability to others. So it is not a pure public good because consumers are still competing for the use of the resource. On the other end of the spectrum, if the good is excludable but non-rivalrous, we are talking about club goods. Club goods are goods that you can exclude consumers from enjoying. Consumers have to join the club if they want to have access to it. Once they have access to it, the use of the club good is going to be non-rivalrous. Think about cinemas, private parks, satellite television. Satellite is a great example. As long as you don't have satellite television, you are excluded from it. As soon as you're in, it doesn't really matter if there are 1 million people watching cable TV or 100. You can enjoy all the channels the same way. Same as a movie in a cinema. Once you buy your ticket, you will enjoy the movie as much as uh, your neighbor. Cinema has limited seats, which is why it is excludable. You can exclude somebody from uh, the movie theater. You can sell a certain amount of tickets, but all the ones who have a ticket then can consume the movie in a non-rivalrous rivalrous way. That's a hard one to say. Does it make sense? It is limited seats, but once you have your seat, you can enjoy the movie as much whether the seat next to you is empty or taken. And I am not taking into account the fact that somebody could be making noise or watching his phone and stuff like that. That's, uh, that would make things too complicated. In fact, there would be room for bargaining here or not, depending on whether people have the right to watch their phone during a movie. You can think about that. Finally, pure public goods would be non-rivalrous and non-excludable. I didn't mention air before because air, I don't know, air feels like it's not something you can really buy. I find it kind of weird. National defense is not something you buy either, but this is something you're entitled to as part of a country. But air, technically, you cannot exclude somebody from breathing. And um, whether you breathe air or one million people next to you breathe air at the same time, doesn't matter. You can still breathe air. Lighthouses are a very good example as well. If you think about a lighthouse, whether there are 100 boats or 1,000 boats using the lighthouse as a way to uh, navigate into the harbor, doesn't make any difference. Boats use the light emitted by the lighthouse. So whether they're 100 or 1,000, doesn't really matter. Can you exclude somebody from enjoying a lighthouse or from using a lighthouse? Well, I guess you can if you reach capacity on the ocean. Once there are too many boats on, uh, on the ocean, then maybe boats, some boats which are too far away might not see um, the lighthouse. But it is definitely non-rivalrous. So there are always specific tweaks to each good but hopefully with this table, you understand the overall idea of um, what excludable goods are and what rivalrous goods are. Okay, so the thing with the public good is that once you produce one unit, it means that one million people can enjoy that unit. So. Can you imagine a private firm just showing up and say, yeah, I'm going to make a lighthouse. Great. There is one lighthouse in Vancouver. What are you doing now? You don't need to do any, you don't need to produce any more. 
one lighthouse is enough for everybody. So then you have to go to another location. In order to find the optimal amount of public good to provide, one can maximize the utility of one agent subject to several constraints. I want the, if the provision of the good to be efficient. So I want to make sure that the good is such that there is no way to increase somebody's utility without decreasing somebody else's utility. Pareto efficient allocation definition. So what you can do is you maximize the utility of one agent, keeping the utility of everybody else constant. This way, you, one person is made better off and nobody else is worse off. That would be one way to do it mathematically. Why not? But you have to remember that budget constraints have to be satisfied. That's the case where consumers are the ones contributing to the public good. They are uh, contributing a certain amount and then given the amount which is gathered, you obtain an overall public good provision. Now, I won't show you the math here because it's not really important, but I'm going to show you the formula you're going to have to know and use. So if you form a Lagrangian, this is the function that includes the utility of our agent plus all of the constraint. This thing called Lagrangian is the same thing you would use in Econ 201 to find the optimal bundle for a consumer. I think some of you might have seen what a Lagrangian is, but for others, you might have seen this problem being solved in Econ 201 just using graphic analysis using the MRS equals price ratio. You saw the geometrical uh, solution. The Lagrangian is the mathematical solution. The Simonson rule is what you get after maximizing this utility. It says that the Pareto optimal quantity of a pure public good is where the sum of individual marginal rates of substitution, MRS, equals the marginal cost of providing the good. Remember that since the good is public, many people can enjoy it. So it's not just my private benefit, my private marginal benefit equals my private marginal cost, which is buying whatever good, the cost of a good, the, good of a, the, cost, the cost of a candy bar, for instance. If the good is public, I am not the only one who's going to enjoy it. So I'm going to add the, social, the marginal utilities of everybody else. The marginal cost is still the same. Whether I am the only one to benefit from a lighthouse or whether 100 other people are benefiting from it, the cost of providing the lighthouse is always the same. So the marginal cost part is not going to change, but the marginal benefit part is going to change. It is going to add all of the marginal rate of substitution. In fact, you can feel the flavor, the same flavor as externalities. With externalities, we said social marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Social marginal benefit was the addition of several private marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Here, this is exactly what we are doing. And a public good is a special case of externality. Now, let's go through an example to see how to apply that rule. Imagine two new roommates, Rosia and Tom. They recently moved in together. They decide to buy kitchenware they can both use. So the amount of kitchenware, G, is going to be a public good because both can use the kitchenware. They also have their own private consumption of another good denoted X. So X is going to be their private consumption. It could be what Russia eats and what Tom eats or 
uh, what Rosia wears as clothes and what Tom wears. They each have an income IR and IT, R for Rosia, T for Tom. And their utility functions are given by the following functional forms. The utility of Rosia when she consumes XR and G is LN of XR plus LN of G. Utility is increasing in both the kitchenware and the amount of the private good. Tom has a different utility function. His utility function depends on his own consumption of the private good XT and on the amount of kitchenware there is in the drawer. It's XT to the power of 0.5 times G to the power of 0.5. Remember, the power of 0.5 is the same thing as a square root. Imagine that the per unit price of X of the private good is one. Whatever it is, it's one. The price of the public good, the price of kitchenware is PG. Each unit of kitchenware costs PG. Imagine you are at the dollar store. Every unit of kitchenware has the same price, $1.50. Now, imagine they both contribute to the public good. So, Rosia is going to contribute an amount GR and Tom is going to contribute an amount GT. So, the overall amount of kitchenware that will be purchased will be equal to the sum of contributions divided by the price of each unit of kitchenware. So, G is a quantity, GR and GT are dollar amounts, PG is a dollar amount. So dollar over dollar cancels dollars and you get a quantity. Now, each roommate has a budget constraint. For Rosia, what she spends in private good plus what she spends in public good has to be equal to her income. She spends an amount, uh, she spends one dollar per unit of XR and she's going to buy XR units of the private good. So XR times one is XR, plus the money contributed to the public good has to be equal to her income. And the same for Tom. It's a standard 201 budget constraint. What is the optimal amount of kitchenware of G of public good to purchase? So, the Samuelson rule says, compute the marginal rate of substitution. Remember, the marginal rate of substitution is the ratio of marginal utilities. Here, I took the marginal utility with respect to the public good first, and then divided by the marginal utility with respect to the private good. If you just do the math on your own, which I suggest you to do, it's good practice. For Rosia, you get XR over G. And for Tom, you get xt over g. Now, Samuelson rule says you add them together and you make them equal to the marginal cost of producing g of the kitchenware, the marginal cost of buying the kitchenware. Note that the sum of those MRS amounts to xr plus xt divided by g. That's just xr over g plus xt over g. Note that those MRS depend on xr and xt. So once we want to find the optimal amount of public good g to provide, we're going to have some xr and some xt in the mix. So things might get hairy. Make sure you follow. If I use the budget constraints, I can actually sub XR and XT for the money amounts for income and for the individual contributions to the public good. So, if I replace XR and XT by those amounts, 
I get xr plus xt over g equals ir minus gr, that's xr, plus it minus gt, that's xt, divided by g. Now, it turns out that g minus gr minus gt over big G is equal to pg, the price of providing the good. That is coming from this condition here. So at the end of the day, you end up with the sum of incomes divided by G minus the price of the kitchenware. And this is just the left hand side of Samuelson rule. The marginal cost of G is PG. So here it's not the marginal cost of pro producing the good. It's a marginal cost of providing the good. Since the good costs PG, then the marginal cost is PG. So let's get into the math. We get MRS plus for Rosia and MRS for Tom equals PG. This expression equals PG. And then you can find G star. G star is now equal to IR plus IT over 2PG. Note that this G star here does not depend on XR and XT anymore. I was able to take XR and XT away by using the budget constraints so that now G star is just equal to the sum of incomes, which I know already, divided by two times the price of getting the kitchenware. This is the same thing. So, I want to emphasize that we could find G star without having to solve for XR and XT because the utility functions are convenient to work with. But from those two conditions, in principle, we would have to solve for XR and XT as well. Using the budget constraints. In general, Finding G star involves finding the optimal amounts of private good as well. It is a whole system of equations to find. Sometimes the math is nice to work with and we can get to the solution like this right away. Another special case is when, when utilities are quasi linear. So if utility functions are linear in the private good, imagine that the utility is equal to ln of g plus x. x here shows up linearly. When you take the marginal rate of substitution, then the derivative with respect to x would give you a 1. And so x will not even show up in the MRS. There is such a case in the tutorial, in the very last question about, um, about a town called Cost Milk in Idaho. and you won't need to do any fancy math. In general though, you might need to find the individual amount of, pub, of, of private goods as well. Okay? Any questions? I just finished the slide by saying that in tutorials, you are going to go through an exercise where you can find G star right away. It is the last exercise of the tutorial and it is something about a town located in Idaho. I just made it up, but that's just to, 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 um, to point you towards the right exercise. Okay, somebody is asking, obviously shouting, I guess to explain the math part. So, this is just an application of the rule. I take my marginal rate of substitution, 
this by now, you should know how to compute them. You take derivatives and then you add them together. Now, we have three variables here, xr, xt, and g. We only have one equation, Samuelson rule. But if you have three variables, it is going to be a problem. It turns out here that if you use the budget constraints, you can substitute xr for, uh, for the budget constraint expressions, income minus public good contribution. And if you substitute that into your sum of MRS, then you will make XR and XT disappear. And this is what I have here. This condition here, you see, doesn't have any XR or XT in it. So when I make this thing equal to PG, the marginal cost of buying kitchenware, then I can, I can solve for G. In general, the marginal rate of substitution might be tricky. Here, they, are, they have a very convenient form. So you can add them together, you can use the budget constraint and so on and so forth. But if utility functions are weird or more eccentric, then the MRS will have a very different form. And when you add them together, it might be very hard to substitute each XR and XT for their expression from the budget constraints. I give you an example, which is relatively easy. And I also talked about the fact that there is another case where it's easy when linear, when utility is quasi linear. I point you to the last exercise of the tutorial on externalities and public goods to see how that looks like. Any other questions? The tutorial recordings have, have not been uploaded yet. They will be uploaded sometime today or tomorrow. You just have to be patient. Right now, the only thing you can find are the problem set solutions. And those solutions are gonna be commented during tutorial recordings. Just be a bit patient. I've asked the TAs to get on top of it. So that should happen soon. Okay. So let's talk about the private versus the public provision of public goods. Think about the private provision of public goods. Ask someone to buy a public good. Well, this person might say, why am I the only one to pay for it? if everybody is going to enjoy it, first of all. So you cannot even ask one private person to provide a public good. They have no incentive to say yes. They say, yeah, but everybody is going to free ride on me. And in general, private provision of public goods through voluntary contributions usually leads to under provision due to the free rider problem. In short, many agents do not take into account the benefit that other people are going to get from the public good. Since they don't think about that, it's a form of externality after all. Since they don't think about that, they will only contribute up to what they think for their own benefit is good. If everybody does it this way, then nobody takes into account the fact that on top of it, people benefit even more from the public good. Other people benefit from it. And so they will be in an under provision of the public good. This is pretty much what uh, we talked about at the beginning of the lecture about externalities, where we said that agents engage too little in activities that generate positive externalities. Public goods are goods whose consumption generates positive externalities. So not enough of the public good will be provided. Typically, some people might decide to just not contribute as much or maybe not contribute at all, hoping to free ride on other people's contribution. 
typical case, uh, think about garbage collection. And like the neighbor, neighborhood council could say, oh, we are going to increase the frequency of garbage collection, but it's going to be based on voluntary contribution. The city is coming once a week to pick up garbage, but maybe we can ask, maybe we can pay uh, the city or something else, another, another uh, firm to come maybe another time during the week to collect maybe another type of garbage. Then the neighborhood council could ask neighbors to uh, pitch in, to contribute, and depending on the amount of contribution, they might pay for this extra service. Chances are many people will decide not to contribute and say, no, I'm fine without, pretending they're fine without, but they will be happy to benefit from it once it happens and they will not contribute for it. That's pure free riding. Okay. So not enough of the public good will be provided with a private provision. There is a special case, of course, if agents are altruistic, if they think about others, if their own utility function depends on the well-being or the wealth of other agents, then they will factor in directly the effect they have on others. And so there won't be any problem. In fact, this is pretty much what would happen with Rick and May and the consumption of cigarettes. If Rick and May are a couple, chances are that they will take each other's utility into account. They will not just say, I like to smoke cigarettes and I don't care if you don't like it. If Rick is going to say, I like cigarettes, but I'm aware that you don't like it too much. If Rick is taking into account the harm caused to May by the consumption of cigarettes, then Rick will automatically decide to consume only two packs instead of four. And so there won't be any uh, market failure. This is what we call internalizing an externality. It's an external effect. If I take it into account, I am internalizing it. So I make it part of my own benefit or my own cost so that the efficient quantity will be um, the market equilibrium. But that's if agent's utility function contains other agents' wealth or utility. That might work for roommates, friends, and so on. But when you decide to consume gasoline, you're not thinking about the quality of the air that I am going to breathe, right? The same way I probably wouldn't if I was uh, consuming gasoline. The other problem with private provision of public goods is that if you ask for people's willingness to pay for public good, you will not get a truthful answer. If I ask you how much are you willing to pay for garbage collection at your home, you're going to guess right away that if you say 10 bucks a month, that might be what I'm going to charge you. So you might have an incentive to just report less. Yeah, I'm willing to pay $2. You're willing to pay more, but you don't want to pay more. So you might say, yeah, I'm willing to pay $2. And that might be the contribution I might ask from you. And again, that might be under provision of the public good. So think about fireworks for Canada Day. Nobody is asking for uh, contributions by consumers. The government is going to simply provide the efficient amount of fireworks. Of course, efficient, I put it in quotation because I don't really know what's efficient, but that could be the duration of the, uh, of the fireworks, the duration of the show, or it could be the quality of them or the quantity and so on. And that provision is made by the government and it is based on taxes. So it is one of the uses of our taxes. But the contribution is not directly asked to consumers. So let me summarize what we covered today. If you consume a good or produce a good that has effects to somebody other than you, 
Then we talk about externalities. If the market is not taking into account the fact that somebody is enjoying that thing, your decision, or somebody is being harmed by your decision, then we talk about an externality. If the market was able to compensate people one way or another, then it, will not, it would not be an externality. Careful. The problem with externalities is that agents, in general, only care about their own well-being, and they do not take into account the disutility or the utility that others are ex the, that others are going to experience due to the agent's decision. Because of that, too much of the bad stuff is going to be produced or consumed, and too little of the good stuff will be produced or consumed. What I say too much, too little, I mean compared to the socially efficient equilibrium, compared to the Pareto efficient equilibrium. So when there are externalities, the market is not Pareto efficient anymore. We saw that sometimes the problems can be solved by bargaining. Coe's theorem is saying that bargaining can lead to an efficient solution as long as property rights are well defined and there are no transaction costs. In real life, those two conditions sometimes are not satisfied and bargaining is a good solution when you only have a small group of people, your roommates, your co-workers, and so on. What if you deal with the whole market? How many people stop at the gas station to get gasoline? You cannot bargain with each of them. And it is very hard to quantify how bad the impact is on the quality of the air I breathe when I am on Burnaby Mountain and you guys maybe are uh, in North Van or West Van or Richmond. In this case, the government can step in and say, too much gasoline is being consumed, so let's tax gasoline to reduce the demand for gasoline and the amount of gasoline that will be consumed at the end of the day will be closer to the socially efficient amount or it will be equal to the socially efficient amount. This is what we call Pigouvian taxation in the case of a negative externality and, posit and Pigouvian subsidy in the case of a positive externality. The same way you're going to tax bad behaviors, you're going to tax goods which generate negative externalities, you want to encourage the production or the consumption of goods that generate positive externalities, you want people to get more vaccines, you want, um, you want beekeepers to have more bees in their, um, in their hives, and so on and so forth. So you're going to subsidize it, you're going to subsidize them. And I believe that right now, the vaccine for COVID-19 is free. I have my appointment next week. We'll see what they say. Hopefully, I won't have to pay for anything. Any questions? For this week's lecture, you can check the book uh, by Darian, and he has a whole chapter on externalities and public goods. I forgot which chapter it is. You can just um, take a look at it. Otherwise, the lecture notes will be enough with the uh, tutorial questions. That's it for this lecture on externalities and public goods. Another reason why markets can fail. Have a good rest of your week. And see you in the next one. Bye.